Welcome to part two of lecture six of aerospace propulsion. So in the end, by applying the momentum theorem, um, we can get to the same thrust equation as we had for jet engines um, from aerospace engineering fundamentals last year. Um, so the mass flow into and out of the propeller, of course, must be equal because there's the, those capture stream tubes we saw. Um, and then so then conservation of mass says that the flow through the sides of the control volume um, has to be equal to the extra flow that's coming out of the back. And there's no net momentum change associated with that flow. So the only change in momentum is for the flow that goes through the propeller. Um, and if we denote that flow uh, rate as m dot, then the thrust is just the mass flow rate um, times ue minus u naught, which is the velocity difference from far downstream to far upstream. We can also look at the power in and out and relate these to the thrust and velocities. So first, if we look at the power to the fluid, this is the power imparted to the fluid by the blades. This is just related to the change in fluid kinetic energy. This is the mass flow rate times the change in specific kinetic energy. And we can also look at the propulsive power, which is the rate at which work is being done on the flow. And this is the thrust times the flight velocity. Combining these two uh, by taking their ratio gives us the propulsive efficiency and we get back to our familiar expression for propulsive efficiency, which is 2 over 1 plus uv over u naught. So as uv over u naught goes to 1, um, the propulsive efficiency approaches 1, and uh, the actual thrust produced, of course, would go to 0. All these expressions for thrust power and efficiency require us to know e. But how are we supposed to know what that exit velocity is? Well, it turns out that the best way to do it is to use actuator disk theory to figure out how UE depends on all the other parameters. So an actuator disk is basically an infinitely thin circular disk across which some of the flow properties change discontinuously. So for our propeller, our actuator disk model is going to uh, assume that uh, the rotation of the flow or the swirl downstream of the propeller is negligible. This is not the greatest assumption, but usually for a propeller, the swirl angles are not going to be large, They're probably less than 20 degrees, so there's only a small approximation inherent there. Um, we'll need to uh, assume that the flow behaves incompressibly so that the Mach numbers are much smaller than 1. Again, this is a bit of a borderline assumption. Um, we'll assume that the stagnation pressure is constant for the flow that does not go through the propeller. We'll also assume that the flow is steady, so basically we're smearing out the blades. This is really the key actuator disk assumption. And we'll also assume that the only thing that changes discontinuously across the disk is the static pressure. And by, by consequence, the stagnation pressure. So that means the velocity must vary continually. So we know we have u naught far upstream, and we want ue far downstream. So we need to figure out the velocity at the location of the disk, which is this vertical dashed line here. We call this u disk. But before we do that, let's think about the static and stagnation pressure variations upstream and downstream of the actuator disk. So given the assumptions we made and the velocity distribution that I just showed, um, which I'll show again here for a moment. Right, so we have a smooth increase of the velocity from u naught to u. Describe the variation in the static pressure and the stagnation pressure from far upstream to far downstream. So think about this for a few minutes. Try to come up with uh, some sketches that will be some answers for yourself before you move on to the next part of the video.